Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, March 11th. Today's topic is projects by Jen and hashtag not at ISTE. Our special guest is Jennifer Wagner. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing our closed captioning for us. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Peg, who will now introduce Jen and ask her the newbie question. Well, thank you very much. It's great to have Jen here today. Jennifer Wagner is the creator of Projects by Jen, has been successfully encouraging teachers since 1999 to use online projects in their pre-K through 6 classrooms. Using various ideas, Jennifer will help you understand how online projects will help you make the most of your time in a variety of ways. Winning numerous awards for her creative ways and encouraging teachers to collaborate, her teaching style is very user friendly, creative, and personable. Jennifer intends, attends many local and state conferences each year, sharing ideas and also frequents many virtual conferences, conference opportunities. Plus, she has a blog and is very happy with the invention of Pinterest. Oh, and she can be quite vocal on Twitter. But no worries, there is life away from tech. Yes, Jen is one of those who can turn off her phone. She is involved with her church, as well as enjoying movies, trivia, reading, long talks with good friends, and being quiet at home with her cat, Mac. So that will bring us to our newbie question. Thrilled to have you here. We've been using it for a while. So here's the question. What are online data collection projects, and why are they so engaging for students? Well, thank you. And um, wow, this is fun. It's like old friends week in the chat. I haven't seen a lot of you for a long time. Um, what are online data collection projects? They're beyond what you're doing in your classroom. I know a lot of classrooms, especially the elementary classroom, especially when you're teaching graphing, are doing a lot of data collection that stays within the walls of your classroom. For instance, you might be um, telling how many of your first graders or second graders are losing their teeth. And that's interesting and that's fun and it, it brings it into your classroom, but the online data collection expands it um, in ways that make it both also um, much more interesting. It brings in the geography um, element of it. It brings in so many opportunities for your students to meet new voices, hear new voices. It's a great way for teachers to connect with each other. Um, it just expands something good that you're already doing in your own classroom and making it great by inviting others to the conversation. And they're so engaging because um, students love meeting new students. And students don't also just like meeting new students. They so much enjoy sharing what they're doing in their classroom. And so often um, teachers are reluctant to share what's happening in their classroom. And my projects hopefully give them a voice where they just enjoy sharing out their data. So I much enjoy um, online data collection in a variety of ways um, that make it easy for teachers to share out information quickly and connect with others um, successfully. I hope that helps answer that question. So. I guess do I continue because this is I love chatting with you guys. I need to let you know that I am not going to be your regular kind of probably um, person that you listen to each week because I am much more um, conversational than I am a lecture. So um, I look forward to chatting with you. I put this first slide here um, because basically what I'm inviting you to do is open. Uh, the door of your classroom. Open the windows of your classroom and start sharing out the wonderful things that you're already doing with your students um, so that others can not only uh, learn from you, but they can also um, get to know you and have your students interact with each other. I'm looking up to see what slide we're on. So I can do this right. And you're going to get to know that I enjoy laughing. So. 
<laughs> if that, um, I'll try not to laugh too much, but I do enjoy this and getting to know all and uh, chatting with all of you. <clears throat> the thing that is I love most about um, online projects, and if I could back up just a moment, there there's two worlds right now that I see with projects. There's project-based learning. Um, and there's projects. And I'm going to be talking more about the projects versus the project-based learning. Um, project-based learning for me goes um, a little bit deeper than projects. Um, projects are more like uh, um, small conversations, uh, little data sharing. Um, they um, are more classroom to classroom, um, where projects Project-based learning to me is um, will go much deeper. Often they are um, projects that uh, could change your community, could change your school. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Mine are more like projects I'm going to be talking about, ways that you're interacting with other classrooms, uh, mostly with data sharing or um, art projects or creativity. Um, are we going to solve a problem in the world? We might. You never know. But I'm going to be talking more about projects than PBL. So I always like to say that at the beginning. Um, but I like this picture here because you you get to determine within projects, and not just my projects, but other projects that teachers are sharing. You can always um, enter in slowly and just get your feet wet, or you can dive deep. And you can, you can just jump in. And um, it's up to you how you um, wish to participate in a project. It was just like uh, maybe maybe just two or three years ago. I've been hosting projects since 1999. And about two or three years ago, I started leveling my project. So teachers can come in at the, at the uh, bottom level, which basically they're collecting the data and submitting it uh, to all the way that they are collect, uh, collaborating on slideshows. They're sharing videos. They're Skyping. They're Google Hanging out. So many things. So if I could back up just a moment. I wanted to give a shout out really quick to David Warlick because it's because of him that I even hosted my first online project. I was at a conference in Long Beach. Uh, they used to have these conferences called Classroom Connect when I was just getting used to tech and, and was a sponge and was absorbing everything that I could. And uh, he had um, a project called the Global Grocery Project and basically he had about 15 items, bread, milk, gas, eggs, etc., that um, teachers were sharing data about. And I think it was either Gail Lovely or it was um, Alice Christie who shared it at the conference. And I was sitting there and I was overwhelmed. Just that's too, that's too much data. Um, I need to narrow it down to one thing. So I was driving in my car and I was thinking and thinking and Toying with all a bunch of different foods, and all of a sudden that Oreo cookie came to mind, and I was like, "Well, you can bite it, you can nibble it, you can dunk it, you can um, pop it in your mouth all at once." And honestly, that's how the um, cookie project started, and uh, it will be our 19th year this year of hosting that project. So I wanted to give a shout out to David Warlick because um, his project really was the springboard to me hosting my first project in 1999. And a uh, wonderful guy. If you don't know David Warlick, please follow him. He um, is just a, a wonderful man and a great educator. And he is one of the pioneers of all this stuff that we um, just love so much in regards to ed tech. So anyway, um, that is the um, getting your feet wet or jumping deep into the water. You can decide which way you want to go. So I'm going to be talking really quickly. You probably know about all these projects, but I just wanted to mention them really quickly if you haven't been involved in them. Um, and there's so many more. And there's another site that has even more listed. And Peggy has gathered them all into the live binder. Uh, again, these projects are mostly elementary based, but they don't have to be. Um, I'm going to start and just circle around. I'm going to start with the monster project. Um, I wish I had thought of the Monster Project. I had not. And it's one of those that, oh, wow. It is, if I could pick one project that I would say you guys need to join, it would be the, Ma the Monster Project. Basically what it is, it's closed for this year, but you still can do it with your own students. 
and just in, invite another classroom on your campus to be a part of it, or connect with someone ver versus um, connect with someone either on Twitter or here um, or on Skype or on Facebook, wherever you connect. Um, the Monster Project is probably to me the best project um, to join because it offers so many opportunities for your students to learn. The premise of it, if you don't know about it, is your students draw a monster, but it doesn't have to be a monster. It could be whatever you want. It could be a flower, a truck, a dinosaur. It could be whatever you want. But then it goes that they have to write a description of it. So now your students are not only looking at what they just drew, but now they're uh, describing it. And then once they describe it, they keep a picture, they keep their picture to themselves. I wish you could see me right now. My hands are just like going crazy with how I'm describing this. They keep their picture to themselves and then they share out their um, description to another student. Um, now, if you were involved in the Monster Project online, you would be emailing your description to another class. But if you do it within your own class, which I would love for you to do, the other the student who gets the description then draws what they see. And now you compare and contrast the original versus the new drawing. What that brings into your classroom is huge. It's going to teach um, descriptive writing, as Paula is saying, so wonderfully in a, a creative way. Your students are going to start realizing that there are different colors of blue and colors of red and colors of orange and colors of yellows. There's a different way to say round. There's a different way to say uh, what really is a square? What's a big square? What's a small square? What's a rectangle? They can start using different shapes. Uh, what is maybe curly to one student might look different to another student. When you say um, uh, a straight line, I'm sorry, a crooked line to someone, someone might interpret that differently. When you say draw a lightning bolt, someone, it's just um, such a wonderful project for getting your students to think and compare and contrast. And um, I love this project. I do this project with teachers as well as students. It's great for a, a, a staff meeting. Um, it could be if you're doing breakout EDU, it could be something that you could throw in the box for something they have to solve before they get one of the keys. It is a wonderful, wonderful project. Um, and what it allows your kids to to learn is um, hands off to this project. Just congratulations, wonderful. This project is is probably one of my favorites. If you go down underneath that at Global School Net, it used to be the portal for online projects, and it's starting to grow back up again. But the thing I got like about the Global School Net is it has a um, a shopping list, I guess, of projects going back for a very, very, very long time. Right now, they don't have very many projects that they're hosting, but what they have in their archives is is immense. And you would be able to look at these ideas, either grow the idea into your own idea, or maybe um, take one of their ideas and um, use it within your classroom. And it is for K all the way up to 12th grade. Um, I have to tell you, this is where I got my start with um, posting and, and collecting participants for my um, project. Um, Al Rogers and Yvonne Andres, who um, pretty much run Global School Net, um, wonderful people, kind people, uh, have a heart for the educator who's trying to connect beyond the walls of their classroom. The Global School Net has um, oh, Many, 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 many ideas for you to go and check out. Um, going to our left is the international dot, the international dot day. Not necessarily yet a a project that teachers are connecting as much as they will in the next couple of years. Um, but the international dot day happens in September. It's based on the book by Peter Reynolds called The Dot. It is a wonderful way for your students to um, learn that what they think they can't do, they can do. It um, allows art, creativity. It um, 
is a fun way of connecting with each other. And I have to give you a backstory real quick. Um, I was just recently at a, um, a spelling bee at um, our local um, ACSI, the uh, um, Association of Christian Schools International, and one of the students' names was Yasti. And I was just like, <laughs> I wasn't even concentrating on the spelling bee because I just wanted to run up to her later and say, there's a book with your name in it. You have to go buy it. And she had not heard of the book. So um, I told her about it, and hopefully she got it. And I really should write Peter and ask him if he could send her a copy of it. Uh, you don't often hear that name, so it was so fun to find someone that had the name. Anyway, International Dot Day. It happens around September 15th-ish. Um, it's um, it's a, um, you would say a little book that is huge. And it just offers so many um, opportunities for your students. Um, and there's also my class, my um, K-6 kids, we have, um, we make it a dot week instead of a dot day. And we also use the Quiver app. Um, which is a 3D kind of um, virtual reality app, augmented reality, AR, VR, I guess both, where it causes the dot that they drew to um, arise off the page. And you know, Peggy, I'm going to um, apologize real quick, but I'm going to run to my website real quick. And um, you know what? I'll come back to it in a bit. I'll backtrack. Hang on. I'll do it in a bit, but um, my students started taking this loading ball, if you call it, and then they started folding it and turning it into a math project, and they started running and getting, uh, I'll have to show you um, when there's time, but it was, um, my students took this project beyond what I even anticipated. So um, hopefully um, it's going to get a little bit more involvement where teachers can connect with each other. I know some people are connecting Skype and Mystery, um, Mystery Skype and Hangouts, but, um, and Paula can correct me if um, I'm wrong, but I don't think that yet they really have turned it into a connecting, connecting project yet. Anyway, um, the Global Read Aloud. Uh, Pernell Rip started this project maybe four years ago. I can remember her first year of posting it. And we were sitting together in um, Illinois at the ICE conference. We were sitting by the glass window looking uh, near the pool. And I turned to her and said, uh, this is going to be huge. And it is. It took me um, probably about 17 years to hit a million participants, and it took her three. Um, the Global Read Aloud happens in September. It um, is for K through 12. Your, the voting is going on right now for suggestions of what books they should read. Uh, Cornell seems to have a way of, uh, with your help, of course, choosing books that end up winning the Caldecott or the Newbery Awards. Um, she's got a good eye. I don't know if you ever saw the movie um, You've Got Mail with Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks, but they say it's the movie um, Tom Hanks' girlfriend says at one point to him um, about the Kathleen Kelly, whatever she puts her fingers on, turns to gold. And that's kind of her nail. She, um, the Global Read Aloud, um, it's a well run project. Um, she, she won't connect you like one to another, but she'll give you the opportunities to, you guys can meet in certain, um, I think she's either using Edmodo or Seesaw, where teachers connect with each other. And um, it, it's just well run. And, and she's juggling over 500,000 teachers in a project, which is kind of huge. And that may be students, but regardless, that still is huge. Uh, a simple idea that is phenomenal, and um, and you, if you if you get anything, I would suggest you do Monster Project first and Global Read Aloud um, as quickly as you could as well. They're wonderful, wonderful projects. And then um, I host online projects as well. I, as I said, I've been doing it since 1999. I didn't do it on purpose. I just sort of was intrigued. 
When I started hosting projects, it was Excel, Word, PowerPoint. I can't tell you how long it took to copy paste everything. Uh, then about 2000, I don't know, 2004, I guess, uh, Google offered Google Sheets and Google um, Forms and all that. And um, projects by Jen just fully changed with the ease of doing it, of collecting the data. When I was hosting, um, backtrack real quickly, when I was hosting um, the Skittles project, um, someone came alongside and helped, EduSpot came along and helped me with collecting data. And um, they were very, very helpful for me to see how easily it was to automate collecting data. And then Google Forms um, came soon after that. And it was just an easy, easy walk into sharing data. Um, my projects are um, simple but effective. Um, we have the o.r.e.o project that happens in September, which we stack Oreos and learn about need, median, and mode, and um, averaging. Uh, we do a project in October for counting seeds in a, pump, in, a, in a pumpkin. In December, we have the holiday card exchange project. Uh, right now, I have three projects going on. I have a, a marble run. I have the day the crayons quit. And I have, starting this next week, the St. Patrick's Day project. Um, my project um, encourage teachers to share their data outside of their classrooms. So it's been great fun. It, um, sometimes I laugh because uh, they're um, interesting to host. I could write a book about the stories that happen with the project. Um, I have met some wonderful, wonderful educators. A uh, little side note, last year I got a very nice note from, actually I'm sorry, two years ago I got a very nice note from one of my participants who had been a fifth grade participant in 2001 who was now, was she fifth grade? Gosh, was it three years ago now? Anyway, she had been a participant and when she became a student teacher, the first thing she did was post the project in her classroom. And it, it just was like, oh my gosh. Um, she said she couldn't wait to become a teacher, that she could host one of the projects. And, and that just really touched my heart. Uh, you know what, Paula? And it's OK um, in regards to, I think it's Nabisco and, and, and the Oreo project. Um, sometimes simple is better. Sometimes having someone um, on board uh, can complicate something that's running rather smoothly. So I'm OK with that. Anyhow, this gives you the links to the uh, projects I suggest. I'm going to try this slide screen share. We'll see. But I'm a little apprehensive to do this. Um, but anyway, if, uh, here's my website, uh, Projects by Jen. If you go to the archived page, Here's uh, most of the projects that I've been hosting. Um, there's little ones that um, I haven't put up there. I try to do one each year that is book-based. I try to do one each year that is a STEM-based. But I honestly sometimes just host a project because something is of interest to me. And I um, want to find out what other people think about it. And I'm not sure what happened, but right now my screen is just turning. So hang on just a sec. And there we go. We're back. Um, hang on just a quick second. Um, I have to answer the door. Just a sec. I'm not getting any sound to the video. I'm doing a video chat. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> we have an activity happening at church today, and they're not getting sound in the sanctuary. So uh, I'm going to have to see what's going on in just a bit. But uh, we're OK. <laughs> so um, I'm going to take a moment to look through the, the chats. And um, did I miss any of the questions that are going by? I don't think so, Jen. Okay. There, are, there have been people sharing projects that they've done, uh, we might get some of those people on mic to, to share how, how
how their projects went, but I haven't seen questions. Okay. Well, um, I would love to hear if if anyone wanted to share um, a thought. Um, why were if it just they could just raise their hands. I, if I could share a, a, a little, I love sharing little stories. Um, one of my favorite projects is the DC Dex project. And honestly, the idea for the project happened from my kitchen to my bedroom because I was walking across my front room and they announced on the news that a duck had laid her eggs in front of the Treasury Department at the, thank you for dropping down the link, um, a duck had laid her eggs in front of the Treasury Department in Washington, D.C. I thought of make way for ducklings right away and um, we had a project. And basically for, oh, I would say less than two weeks, there were over 175 classrooms that were waiting to see what would happen and when the eggs would hatch and how many eggs would hatch. And we even had a contest on when the eggs would hatch. We had a contact at the Treasury Department that was feeding us information. This was before RSS, so we were searching the internet every day trying, or how we knew how to use RSS, I guess, to collect um, information. And the closest water source was the, um, the fountain at the um, White House. And usually ducks will go to the closest water source. So we were like so excited. You know, where were the ducks going to walk to? And anyway, they ended up putting them into a, a carrier and taking them elsewhere. We thought maybe they'd end up at the tidal basin. There were, this was such an exciting project. Um, and so I have to say that um, that was one of my uh, projects that I was just so happy to host. The project that I've learned the most from probably would be Shoeless and Bark, which was a tie-in with the Lewis and, Clark, Lewis and Clark anniversary. And uh, so I had this little beanie baby called Shoeless and a little, I'm sorry, yeah, a little beanie baby cat called Shoeless and a little beanie baby dog called Bark. And they traveled in a box to, um, we had eight, eight boxes that were going around. And we had, I had put like a, a, a newsletter in it and coins in it. And um, we had a whole bunch of things, it, books in the box and video in the box. And it was like a little travel project that went from um, month to month to different classrooms. And there were five days of, of things to do with the box and with the, um, the topic. And I learned so much by putting that project together um, regarding Lewis and Clark. And uh, um, wow, that was a project that um, I was happy that I hosted as well. That was probably my hardest project to put together. But it was, for me, it will always be deep down one of my favorite projects. Um, I didn't know if anyone wanted to take the mic, so <laughs> I just kept talking. I do know that you want to talk to me about uh, a little bit about knotted ISTE as well. So um, do we want to wander into that? Oh, Mike Mulligan, that is, that is one book that I want someday will be a project. I'm not sure when, but Susie, I, I love that book. Uh, you know what, Peggy? I'm OK with not sh screen sharing unless you need me to screen share, because you're doing a great job um, putting in those links. And I tend to just be rattling for someone who said this. <laughs> I don't like share. <laughs> I guess I'm just chatting. Um, so do we want to move on to let's, let's have Paula contribute first before we move on to Nada Nishki. She had her hand raised. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so exciting to hear Jen's voice. I love listening to her. Um, Jen has been a mentor of mine for many, many years. And I started her projects back in, I think it was around 2004. And I love sharing this one story, Jennifer. It, it was so funny. Do you remember when you were doing the Lincoln birthday um, anniversary? And we were all yes. trying to read the Gettysburg Address <laughs> via Skype? 
simultaneously. <laughs> that was my that was my first dipping my toes into trying to use Skype, and I could not get it to work properly, and I couldn't join in with everybody else. So what I did was I had two classrooms side by side, and I put half my kids in one room and half the kids in the other room, and we turned Skype on, and we just Skyped with each other <laughs> from room to room and did the Gettysburg yeah. Address, because that was the only way I could make it work. But because yeah. of you and your project, I was determined to learn how to use Skype, and it sure led me into lots of great adventures. So I've always appreciated that because of you, I, I started doing video conferencing, and I've taken and used Google Skype as Google Hangouts when I do most of the projects, and I'm connecting with at least one other classroom, usually several, the things like the Oreo project or the <coughs> holiday card exchange or uh, the pumpkins, whatever. You know, whichever one we're involved in, we try to go ahead and do a a virtual conference connection with another class, and it's always been so much fun. And I appreciate you. I also remember talking to you because I wanted to run our collaborative project. So because of you, I did my first global collaborative project back in 2012 called um, the 12-12-12 Blogging Challenge. So on December 12th of 2012, everybody that participated had to write a blog about their 12 favorite whatever. So that was my first foray into global projects. So I do appreciate everything you do. I know it's a lot of hard work. And I sing your praises everywhere I go. Thank you so much for all you do. Well, Paula, I have to tell you it was great fun. And like I, I think in regards to really feeling that making a difference, because we all want to make a difference in the world was I think um, when I connected you and Jan Wells is still one of my happiest thoughts, you know, the fact that um, Teachers connecting and and then meeting, yeah. So thank you, thank you so much, and thank you for all the things that you do as well. And we've had a request to hear about guess the wordle. Okay, so I'm going to try to screen share this. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. So guess the wordle basically um, it um, it pretty much took over my life for about three years because I decided to host a Wordle every single day. Uh, Wordle is an online uh, website that you could type in words and then it would make you a word picture. There's other ones that you can use besides um, Wordle, um, but Wordle worked for me. And so basically every day for I think two or three years I would post a Wordle online for people to come and guess. And then I started realizing that I was making connect, uh, uh, making little collections of Wordles. And so I started throwing them together into packets that teachers can use. So if you go to this website, these are all free to download for you to use within your classroom. Um, all I ask is if it, you do post them somewhere else that you give a shout back to me. But um, it, um, it, Wordles are just a very easy way for you to have your students look at something and try to figure out what the answer is to the question. For instance, like if I go here to uh, level two, and maybe I go down here to um, see what some of the choices that um, I know the answer to because I wasn't ready to to share this with you, but um, so I don't have the answer key in front of me. But all of these have, um, they're just not easy, quick um, solutions. You kind of have to look at it and then figure out what each one has in common. Anyway, this is just the Wordle. Um, I was especially happy, pleased, etc. Uh, my state Wordles. Um, each of the letters of the name of the state are the background of those is the state flag. So that did take a little 
<laughs> a little bit of time. But uh, it was just uh, an endeavor that I kind of started doing and, and um, it was working and my students were enjoying it and other teachers were enjoying it. And uh, I was happy that I did it. And it, I tend to do things before everyone catches on to them. And so, like, now teachers are like, oh, Wordles. And I'm like, oh, OK. I remember when I used to do it a long, long time ago in the early 2000s, uh, maybe mid-2000s, I hosted an a online podcast which now I go back and I listen to and I go, gosh, we were so ahead of the curve. I really need to post that again now because so many more people are listening now than they were um, such a long time ago. Uh, so anyway, that, that's just the wordle in your, and it's free. It's freely uh, shared with you. Have fun with them and um, enjoy them. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Dr. Thomas Ho asked for the mic. You have the mic now? Uh, you can go ahead and, and it's your turn. Please turn on the mic. Use that talk button. Okay, sorry. You hear me now? <laughs> yeah, yes, I'm sure can. Yeah, just wanted to point out the link I posted in the chat. Um, DC Education launched Google Meet yesterday, and you folks are going to uh, love it for uh, me throwing your questions up to yourself on the nuts there. Uh, you're going to have to ask your G Suite administrator to go and install a Google Meet on the domain to make it available to those uh, student organizations students who want to use it. Uh, but uh, I think I can Thank you. Uh, okay, Jen, I, I think we can move on to uh, not at ISTE. Okay, so um, when I was invited to talk about the projects, I um, the not at ISTE came up, and, and in a way, you could say that not at ISTE is a project um, as well. I need to give kudos and a shout out to Dennis Grice because he originally started um, the not at ISTE. Um, I was having a little bit of a, oh, I don't get to go to ISTE. And so he um, kind of carried me around on his laptop <laughs> that day and uh, at, the, at that conference. Uh, several other people participated as well. And again, I have to give a shout out to Google because with Google Communities, it made it very easy to start growing a group. So he started it in 2014, and then in 2015, he actually went to ISTE. Again, I didn't get to go to ISTE, so I said, let me run with it. And um, Peggy came on board, and Vicki Sedwick came on board. And, and the, this little group uh, grew overnight to, um, we're almost to 1,200 now participants. We try to echo um, ISTE as much as we can. We have Ignite sessions. We, you can create a badge if you wish. We have contests. We have karaoke. We have door prizes. Uh, thank you big time to Tony Vincent last year who pretty much periscoped all the um, poster sessions for us. Uh, you can be as inactive or active as you wish with the group. You can be at ISTE or you can be not at ISTE. You can participate all year long because um, Peggy did a great job of collecting the resources and there were hundreds, if not thousands, of resources into a live binder. The, <coughs> the group is um, open the whole year. Uh, however, it's most active during the time of ISTE. Um, it's a very, very um, I don't know if non-professional is the right way to say it. Uh, we do not have sponsors. We are not affiliated with ISTE in that they have not come and said, yes, run with this, or they haven't said, don't run with this. Uh, we are just um, a bunch of educators who are taking along, taking advantage of the willingness of people who are at the conference 
uh, freely and willingly sharing out what they're learning. Um, it um, is very easy. I, 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 it sounds like it's huge. It sounds like it's very hard to manage. Uh, each person who helps in the group uh, does it because they want to. Um, someone hosted a karaoke. Um, I have no idea what happened at that. Someone hosted a Voxer. I'm not sure what happened at that. Uh, Peggy does her live binders. Not sure how she does that. It's like this group is run by people who are willing to do what they're good at and taking the time within one week of really sharing it out. And uh, the only issues that we've had were um, we really don't want solicitors, so I really have to keep an eye on our group to make sure that people don't come in and start um, uh, trying to monetize their project uh, in the midst of this group. I feel, feel very protective over this group. I feel, feel very protective over anyone who joins the project by Jen um, in that uh, you don't become a way for someone to either spam you or collect your data or et cetera. That's just my something that I feel strongly about. Um, I know that uh, other people may not have that same wariness that I do, but I do feel strongly about that, trying to keep it simple, trying not to um, turn it too much into um, a company, I guess. I, I might be wandering in my thoughts right now, but not at ISTE has worked. And uh, people have been appreciative. I noticed that they're going to have a not at Q this year. Uh, we did try not at EdTech conferences, but there's so many conferences that we could uh, keep up with it. So basically, not at ISTE is the one I keep uh, my eye on the most. This year, I'm sort of stepping back a bit and letting Vicki and Peggy run with it, hopefully knock on uh, desk. I will get to go to ISTE this year, and I'll be able to be sending them information. Uh, but it's, um, it's just a wonderful way of being at the conference by not being at the conference. Or being at the conference when you're at the conference. I bet we, being not at ISTE, got more information than those who were at ISTE uh, because we were able to gather just the highlights. Uh, we didn't have to go sit in an hour session. We could just get the best gems by people sharing. And uh, thank you so much to Tony Vincent who walked the poster session and just continually shared out what was going on. Uh, but that's not at ISTE. Anyone can join. It is a closed group. Uh, but that basically means you ask to join and uh, we let you in. Um, and we have bingo, and we have, uh, Peggy, what are some other things that we do? I was sitting here thinking, should I jump in? I get so excited when we talk about Nada Disti because there were so many great opportunities. And um, one of the things I wanted to point out in that, I'm so glad you used that image because we learned how to create badges with those cute little ribbons on them in the Not at Disney conference. And if you do any kind of a virtual conference, this is a really fun, wonderful activity for your participants to do. And what we did was we just created a slideshow, a Google slideshow, and every person that wanted to created a, this slide with their badge on it and any other information they wanted to share. It was a great way to get to know each other. But there were, that was one of the challenges. And, and in the challenges, you could earn points for participating in different things. One really fun thing I got to do was because of the challenge, the, what was supposed to happen is we were supposed to contact people who were actually at ISTE and ask them to bring our image up on their laptop or their <laughs> smartphone and, and get someone to take a picture of us with them, just like 
we were there. And I had so many great friends volunteer to do that. I think I maybe had 19 images that were tweeted out of people who were bringing me to ISTE. And it just made me feel so much a part of the group. So the challenges are, are fun, but they're also wonderful ways to connect with other people. So I wanted to share a couple of those things, but Tony Vincent's periscopes were great. It is so hard to get around to see all of those uh, poster sessions. Uh, even if you can get to them, it's hard to get up close to them. Tony got right up close and he interviewed the students and the teachers who were presenting there. So we got to save those periscope recordings and put them in the live binder. And there are even posts in the live binder that come from blog post reflections of people who wrote them up after ISTE. So with that live binder, we could extend that conference as long as we wanted. You can still go to it now and see things that happened last year that will really get you inspired about this year's conference. So those are just a few of the highlights for me. But if you can't go to ISTE, and I'll tell you what, even if you can, there were a lot of people who were actually at ISTE that joined us and shared with us on the hashtag. And that's where we were able to get a lot of our, our um, resources, videos, and things that we could add to the live binder. So either way, plan to follow us on Not at ISTE and share freely. We would love that. The thing that, that you just tapped on is, and, and I had forgotten about the challenge, is that we, we have like maybe 15 ways that you could earn points. And we had about 40 door prizes that were donated to us. So everyone got, and if I remember right, I think Peggy was a door prize winner. But um, there were so many little things like post a badge. So the person who had never used a Google slide suddenly was introduced in a non-threatening way to a slide, uh, a shared collaborative slideshow. They learned how to insert. They learned how to add text. They learned how to add, a, add an image in a very non-threatening way. Or maybe you got points for being a part of a Voxer group. So again, you were introduced to a new opportunity in a non-threatening way. And I think that's one of the things about Not at ISTE is that it it has grown on its own as people are willing to share ideas. So if, and because it's not sponsored, we have the ability to just let people fly at what they're willing to share and they're good at sharing. And um, it's been uh, a wonderful, safe place for, for people to learn so many new opportunities. Um, and I think Peggy would agree with that. Um, we very much like um, not at ISTE and uh, the simpleness of it and the fun of it. Anyway, I'm looking at the clock. I'm seeing that, um, does Susie want to take the mic? I'd love to hear. And, and why Susie is getting ready to take the mic. I have to agree with what Peg just said. Even though you're not there, you kind of feel like you're there. Um, and the nicety of it is um, you're in your own environment. So you're not having to pay a hotel or airfare or whatever. You're, you're getting to enjoy the conference uh, from your own home or your own work or your own car or your own Starbucks or whatever, wherever you are. I, I, I don't like uncomfortable pauses, so <laughs> I'm not sure, so I'll wait for Susie to start talking. Anyway, if I could encourage you to do not at ISTE again, uh, this next week is the Q conference in Palm Springs, and I know that they are doing a not at Q 
So if you would like to join that and you're on Twitter, you can just um, search not at Q and you can see a little bit of um, their, theirs is a little bit different than ours. Um, so you'll you'll be able to look and compare and get ideas, do good ideas from each. If you're someone who goes to other conferences like METC or ICE or uh, FETC or <laughs> all the different conferences there are, think about if you can't go, maybe you could not at it and invite other people into the conversation. And Peggy, I am going to let you go ahead and wrap it up. Thanks so much, Jen. I'm go thanks so much for for sharing with us today. I the only question I caught you already a answered, and that, that was about the the uh, guess the wordle. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy now, who will talk about what's coming up next. Thank you so much, Jen, for that fantastic conversation presentation. It was just great to hear from you because the projects are so exciting. But getting to hear you talk about them was wonderful. So thank you very much. We have some great shows coming up. And next Saturday, we're going to be featuring <laughs> Blooms, which is a great parent communication tool. And the following week, we have a featured teacher who is a fifth grade teacher. Ken Ehrman will be with us. The week after that, Desiree Alexander, amazing tech educator, is going to share all kinds of resources and tips for creating video. And she's calling it Not Your Grandmother's Video. The following week, Adam Bello is going to join us to tell us all about Breakout EDU. And if you haven't discovered that, you are going to love it. Just some great things going on there. We won't have a show on Easter holiday weekend for the US. But on April 22nd, we're going to have a special um, show on digital citizenship and raising digital kids with Steve Garten from Common Sense Media, followed by a terrific presentation by a mother and son team who created Did Sit Kids. And it's all about digital citizenship from a kid's perspective. So we hope you'll join us for all of those. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Harkadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session yourself. And as long as your session is public, it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher for the month by following this link here or taking the tab in the Live Finder. You can nominate yourself as well as a featured teacher. The video collection is on iTunes View. That is the video collection of the archives. And as you exit the session today, the survey for Classroom 2.0 Live should open up in your browser. If not, you can take the link from the chat box or the link in the Live Finder. And when you complete that survey, you can request a professional development certificate. It will print out your name. Thanks to Patty Ruffing, and thanks to Patty for sending these out. Make sure you request this to be sent to a personal email address. Uh, schools tend to block these from getting to you. Special thanks again to Jennifer Wagner, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming.